Welcome everyone. So this is class eight where we're going to be talking about factory and logistics. Um, to begin the class, I will be giving an overview of, uh, of what it means to set up a factory, what it means to engage in supply chain management. And then later in the class, um, uh, we, uh, for the second part, we'll have a guest lecture from Stefan Yak who, uh, from Google. Uh, which I'm really excited about to get really under the hood and to think about what kind of equipment can go into these factories. Um, and then finally, we will have a, uh, our lab as normal. And in this lab, we'll be talking about a minimum viable product and kind of starting to, to create something out of your brainstorming. And I will say just in general that these two lectures kind of get ahead of where you are in the development process with your project. So you should kind of know that um, what we talk about today, you should think about, but you don't have to have, you know, immediately included in your in your team project. But it's, uh, you know, we just have to deliver this content so um, so that you are prepared later to start incorporating it all together. Um, so with that, let me share my screen and let's get into it. All right, so we'll be talking today about manufacturing and logistics for industrialized construction. And we go back to our famous framework here for industrialized construction. And in particular, um, we'll be focusing in on two areas. So we'll be talking about logistics mostly, but we'll sp speak a little bit at the end also about um, reuse of experiments, uh, experience and measurement as well. So those are the two uh, main topics that we'll be talking about in class today. And what I mean by logistics integrated into the building process are these four key points. So these are kind of the overarching points that you could take away for what it means to really integrate logistics into the building process. Um, so first, the flow of materials and the related information can be integrated with the design, planning, manufacturing, and site work. So it really creates a connection between um, materials and information with all the activities. Also with industrialized construction, the second point becomes quite important. We have to think about transportation and how we coordinate that throughout the supply chain. Um, you also have to think about transportation if you're not doing offsite modular prefabricated elements, of course, but those are typically handled by the suppliers themselves and not by the company coordinating the construction uh, activities. But with industrialized construction, this often shifts into the scope of work of the prefabrication company rather than the individual suppliers. Um, third, the material component and element supplies are involved in the development processes. And what this means is that you actually understand your supply chain in the development of your products. Um, the simplest example is, if you are gonna use a modular, uh, a volumetric modular approach, um, those, those large modules need to fit on top of the size of the truck or the lorry, the LKV that you need um, to, to, uh, to deliver the, the, the modules. And so you have to think about what's the size that you can design for, for your transportation uh, uh, system. So this is how you start connecting these parts together. And finally, um, and we'll show a couple of examples later in the class, you have suitable equipment for materials handling throughout the supply chain. And this is really about um, using equipment in a smart way so that you also release the burden on workers to be craft, um, to, to craft individual solutions, but instead you find better ways to have kind of humans and machines participating together um, in, the, in the factory or, or in the assembly of the elements. Maybe a picture of what this logistics looks like here. You can kind of see the idea of uh, on the top left of prefabricating things like the bathtub. Uh, the bath is being in, you know, installed, right? So now you have to think about the logistics behind carrying and making sure that that bath is going to be you know, secured and, and not damaged in, in the whole process. Um, in the bottom left here, you can see that the, the pre-delivery of certain parts and components and, and same here where you have specialized tools that are used for loading large panels onto, uh, onto trucks. So you start to get into the specialization of equipment. And really what industrialized construction does is because you have a standardized product or product platform, um, you start to be able to invest in more specific machining technologies, logistics technologies, 
Whereas if you look at the nature of most uh, construction tools and equipment today, they're very general tools. So they're made to be modified and to do a lot of different tasks, but they're not very specialized. If you think about, for example, a handsaw, or as, as I call it in the US, a skill saw, right? That's a very flexible tool, right? You just make any cut with your hand that you'd like and um, you do what you need with it. Um, but as you start uh, investing in some level of standardization, you start to think about, um, you know, is that tool really the most efficient? Is that tool the most safe? Um, can we think about more specialized tools that do the job that we know we have to do over and over again? Um, so that's just an example of, of how this, um, how the standardization enables us to invest also in more specialized and efficient tools in theory. Um, and a big thing we're gonna talk about today is the idea of a manufacturing strategy. Um, and there are two different ways to handle this. Um, we've heard examples from our case studies so far, and I just wanted to kind of put them on a, on a spectrum so you could think about how we've, we've heard about this happening. Um, there's a spectrum from distributed partners on one side, and I'll say more about this later, but the idea that um, you have a distributed network of factories working together, um, but the, the actual company that's that's kind of coordinating everything, like uh, Project Frog, or we saw last week with Rivea and Splash Modular, um, are not actually owning the factory. Swiss Property also talked about this as well. They don't want to buy the equipment or own the factory. They want to kind of design and coordinate everything, but they want to leave the risk of the high capital investments um, to uh, the other companies, right, that maybe already own a factory or they want to contract with these with these factories, right? So this is the idea of kind of a distributed network of partners, and that's the manufacturing strategy. On the far right, you have the integrated factory. So Bocluc gave us an example of their factory where they do everything inside that factory um, and they hold all the processes uh, to complete the modules and ship them um, from, you know, kind of A to, to Z, so, you know, the, the, whole, the whole process. Um, and so that's the idea of an integrated factory. And then somewhere in the middle, um, we'll talk in two weeks about Katera. Um, I have a little bit later also some more examples for them. Um, they kind of have a setup where they have multiple dependent factories. So they have some factories that do uh, uh, certain parts and modules and some parts, some factories do, for example, their cabinetry and some factories that do um, their, their uh, wall panels. So they kind of have multiple dependent factories and they have to come together. So that's a, a little bit in the middle um, uh, between these distributed partners and integrated factory approaches. But I wanted to kind of start here and get you involved a little bit. So thinking a little bit about the, uh, about the nature of these distributed partners versus a single integrated factory. And I want to challenge you, you, this wasn't necessarily in your reading, but I want to see what you could come up with. Um, could you think about on a two by two, what are the benefits and what are the challenges for each of these? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna open up the breakout rooms and you can self-select um, as before. So please feel free to you know, uh, pick, pick a room with your friends if you want, or just randomly pick a room. It doesn't, doesn't really matter to me. Um, and see if you could brainstorm, okay, if you have a network of distributed partners like Splash Modular or Project Frog, um, what are the benefits of that approach? And then what are the challenges of that approach? And same thing with, if you think about Bocluc as an example, um, a single integrated factory, what are the benefits of having your own factory? And what are the challenges of having your own factory? And I think you got it. Uh, I already see a lot of uh, very good responses that I would, I would really agree with. Um, you know, here you have the idea of, of uh, benefit of more flexibility of, of business model. Um, in fact, we'll talk next week a little bit more about business models, but how um, if you don't invest in the equipment, then you're much more flexible to changing technology. So you could go from timber to steel to 3D printing um, in theory, uh, maybe not in practice, but in theory more more quickly because of uh, the less flexibility. Um, so that was really good uh, uh, points here about less dependence and and also, yeah, that you can create a network of production near the construction site to reduce your um, reduce your, your travel time. Um, but on the other side, you have less control, right? So um, if you want to make a change or you want to optimize the manufacturing, um, you have to really go and work with that manufacturer, that partner, and that can take longer. And this co-creation process can be more difficult. Um, and yeah, all, all it's more risky as all stakeholders in the ecosystem must produce the right products at the right time. So, so managing that supply chain and making sure that everything will arrive at the right moment is also a, a big challenge here. Um, on the other side with the integrated factory, we talked about um, easier opportunities for efficiency improvements, 
um, and faster ad uh, adaption to the problems faced uh, and no, no kind of I IP problems with uh, intellectual property because everyone's within the same company and control the whole process. Completely agree. This is the idea that it, you can have your own factory and you could go really fast to, to, to design your product here. Um, but then on the other side, you have this really big investment risk um, and less resilient to shocks in the supply chain. So, you know, what it really comes down to is that I'd say that there's kind of two, two areas you have to focus on and depending on if you're more of a distributed manufacturing model or integrated factory, you have to pay more attention to one or the other, but you still have to pay attention to both. And so on the left side, if you're more distributed, you have to really pay attention to supply chain management and the principles of, of managing your supply chain. So we'll talk about that first. Um, and then if you're more on the factory operations, um, then you have to really think about your optimization of your factory creating a, a kind of more lean production line and, and be more invested in your production planning. So that's if you're more on this side. So in the future, when you're deciding on any kind of manufacturing strategy, um, you can also think about uh, which one of these you need to pay more attention to in your, in your um, manufacturing approach. Now, of course, there are ones that are outside of this paradigm as well. Um, there's the idea of smart mobile factories that are kind of uh, multiple factories, but distributed on the exact site of production, so they're meant to kind of move around. We also have 3D printing, which is another kind of version of, of an on-site factory, you could think about it. Um, so you might think about how those might fit, but I'm not talking about them today, but still the same principles uh, uh, can be applied to them. Okay, so let's talk about supply chain management first. <clears throat> And uh, initially, a while back, and you saw this in the reading as well, there are four roles of supply chain management in construction. Um, so the first, this is just a little bit of theory and we won't go too deep here, but the first is the interface between the supply chain and the construction site. I should say this applies to all construction. So this is not necessarily industrialized construction, um, but the interface between the supply chain and the construction site. Um, the focus here is about reducing the cost and the durations of the, of the site activities. Um, and, and making sure there's no impact on the, the delivery or the availability of the supply chain here. Um, the second way is you could focus on the supply chain itself. Um, and so this is really about reducing the costs, um, logistics, lead time, and inventory of the supply chain, okay? So here you're really trying to say, okay, even within the supply chain, how do I optimize the, uh, the time to delivery of the site, right? So that's the focus on the supply chain. Um, third is about the transfer of activities from the construction site to the supply chain. And this is really a, a large part of what we talk about with industrialization of construction, especially with offsite, is the idea that um, you take activities from the construction site and you move them into the supply chain. So the prefabrication of a wall element, for example, uh, you see here the construction site box is a little bit smaller, the supply chain is a little bit bigger, right? So you're now moving the, the, the activities into the supply chain, so you have more prefabrication, pre-processing. And finally, the fourth one is the focus on integrated management of the supply chain, the construction site. So this fourth one really is about um, focusing on kind of uh, uh, moving site production into supply chain management and managing it all holistically. And we have a few examples with industrialized construction of this as well. Um, if you're very interested in supply chain, that's not the focus of this class. It's probably deserving of, of its own class by itself. Um, but this was a nice paper I saw recently about resilient supply chains and industrialized construction. And they did a nice job of identifying these supply chain vulnerabilities um, we're not going to go through this whole diagram, but you can read the paper if you're interested. Um, but really, there is we have a lot of supply chain vulnerabilities. So they could be project or organizational, where the project's set up differently. It could be around process. It could be around technology failures. It could be around suppliers or customers either not providing or, or not paying for, for, for goods. It could be the external environment. The Suez Canal comes to mind with that big uh, block, which I talked to somebody yesterday, a neighbor who works in supply chain. He said it will be months before the global supply chain is on track after the big block in the Suez Canal. Um, if you don't know about that, uh, you can look up uh, the guy with the digger in the Suez Canal and his, uh, his great efforts um, there. And then finally, there could be financial shocks. So uh, supply chains could go out of business uh, or individual companies in the supply chain could go out of business, which would disrupt the entire um, supply chain. Um, and here's an example, uh, just one example of a supply chain process for modular volumetric construction. Um, and here they had a, the idea that um, they were modeling these unorganized pieces 
that had to then go through delivery um, to the, the, the ports. So here's the ports. Um, they get loaded onto the boats. They go through the shipping process. This would be for an international supply chain. Then they're delivered. Then they go to a module shop. So these module shops then assemble modules. And then the, the modules go onto the truck and then they come over here and then the crane would install the modules on site, right? So this was just in one example, how they modeled the, the, the supply chain. There are many different configurations and you will have to think about also what is your kind of uh, supply chain uh, processes look like. So who is touching what material and when are they touching it? Um, as we talk about the distributed factory, this gets into the points about industry 4.0 that we talked about. This is just a generic um, uh, uh, image about industry 4.0 from, I believe it's from HP several years ago. But I think it's helpful to think about, you have these multiple factories that are distributed. They may be part of the same company or they may be a part of different companies. And you have uh, this network of suppliers, customers, subcontractors, production. Um, and so at each factory, there's individual things happening. And then you have to manage the networks uh, between all of them to ensure that your, um, your delivery occurs on time. And I think as many of you rightly pointed out, there's, there's challenges with this, but there's also more resilience in the supply chain if you can do it this way. Um, we see the development of tools for material flow management. This was from um, uh, Dr. Xian Chen, who just recently completed her PhD at, uh, at EB, at ETH. Um, and she developed a material flow management process that connected a, a BIM with these prefabricated columns and uh, a, a, a kind of a, a GUI, a, a graphical user interface, so that you could understand the different changes in the supply chain here. So you can see the different coloring of the different modules uh, or the different uh, columns. So as they're going through different stages, um, you know, from manufacturing to uh, loading on a truck to, to um, arrival on the site to in installation to inspection, you would have different color codes for the different pieces. And she managed to set this up with uh, an RFID system so that uh, it would be automatically updated, right? So this would be very um, advanced supply chain management tools. We also see some um, industry ready tools. This was a guest lecture we had, and we'll also put this, I think, on the Moodle. Um, I don't think it's, I don't think we have a copy live on the on our, our YouTube channel, but um, a, a company called Manufacton, which is a supply chain uh, manager company for offsite construction. They were recently acquired. Um, so keeping the theme of recently acquired companies, uh, they were re recently purchased um, and they basically just uh, uh, created tracking software for offsite construction. Um, and so then you can kind of manage each stage of the process and you can manage it across multiple factories or multiple companies. Um, so that's just one example of, of emerging tools. So you can look up Manufacton. We'll also share the guest lecture uh, that was, I'm almost certain it was recorded so that you can, if you're interested, you can have a look there. Okay, so that's part A, which is supply chain management. And it's a very short overview and probably not as detailed as Really, it deserves, like I said, it could be its own class, but we just don't have time to cover it in, in any more detail. But um, the, the main point is that, is that in some way, you'll have to think about how supply chain and management and logistics will work for your, for your company. Um, on the other side, we have factor optimization and production planning. And here we get into the, the, the details of factory-based production. Um, and I, I, I went back and, and I, I talked with, uh, with my colleague, Jörg Lessing, because I think they have some really good images. And I, so I share some of these from Bocluc. These ones are from Bocluc. Um, so these are a couple of his slides uh, where they talk about optimized production. So they only build their own products. They're not gonna build for somebody else. They optimize their own workflow. So they go through this idea of, of reuse and continuous improvement to optimize their workflow. They standardize their processes. They, they say that the more standard the process is, the better for them. They focus on recurring activities, continuing improvements and minimizing waste. And here are just some examples of this factory-based production. Um, I mean, it, in some ways it feels obvious that a, you know, a work site should be this clean, but if you've been to any construction site or you've walked by any construction site, you know that the reality is that construction sites are not this clean, they're not that optimized for production. Um, here you can see the workstations, you can start to invest in specialized tools and uh, start having, um, these, these are examples of kind of, uh, of kitting or, or pre-kits of, of, uh, to be assembled so you have everything um, put together so that you just need have all the right pieces you need and you don't have to make any cuts uh, at the assembly station. 
Um, we've talked about automated machinery. So here's a RAND deck, um, automated nailer, I believe, if I, if I remember correctly. Here are examples of floor elements. So these are much more manual processes, uh, as Alex was just talking about. And you can see, you know, um, here you have kind of the manual insertion of the insulation here, but you also have some advanced uh, uh, robots, which help. This is, a, this is, I believe, uh, I actually can't remember, recall exactly what that was for. Um, but here you have an example, I think, of, of, of what I'm talking about, which is uh, having the right equipment here. This is an automatic uh, panel mover, so they can come use a kind of a vacuum uh, uh, suck to pick up the piece and move these heavy plywood, which um, can be quite heavy and, uh, and not good. I mean, one time it's fine, but if you're doing it every every time over and over again, it can be dangerous for the workers just with back pain or things like this. So we start to, to invest in the suitable equipment for the manual work. Um, then with the module assembly, uh, this is another example for Bocluc. They, they assemble their modules to a very high degree. We saw this earlier with their, with their presentation, but they're doing most of the work in the factory with only minimal things done on, on the site. Um, a little bit more details here with the optimized workstation. So the materials are supplied um, from the, the curtain to the left. Um, and uh, some workstations is pre-cut and adjusted for the quick installation. And then um, it's replenished from the outside. Uh, so the idea is that you have the materials coming from the outside and then you have the work here in the middle and then you have the inside, you have the modules moving through the space. Um, and then uh, you, you have the waste material that you kind of send away um, uh, as it moves out. And then over here, you see that each workstation has a set of tools and components organized with 5S. 5S is a lean manufacturing principle. And so you, you truly try to optimize your workstations, keep them clean, and uh, not have tools that you don't need nearby. Um, this is an example from a company called Schanheim, who, who I also visited. Um, this is an example of, of a not very automated company, but uh, a small factory that's equipped for their own production. Um, they do a lot of prefabrication of the wall units, but they're not using automated processes. So you do not have to focus on automation. Um, but they have a simple layout with two production lines and optimized workstations again. And here you, you see that they're installing these in the factory. Um, here you see, because they're on these, these lines, so uh, in this case, the wall panels are moving, but there are also examples where um, the, the modules will stay still and the workers will move. Um, so you, can, you have to decide what's the best way to do it. Um, but here you have these rolling work tables for the easy movement of elements. So you can imagine them just rolling down the line as in an assembly line process. All right, so this was a recent line. Um, we'll talk about Katera and their challenges in the near future, uh, in two weeks to be exact. Um, but I think we also have to think about the things they're doing really well. Um, I thought this was a good example of how they've invested in an automated um, roof truss, truss assembly here. So uh, we'll have our lecture later from Goodall who provides some of these gantries and other equipment. You see their logo at some point in this video. Um, and also ABB Robotics to uh, assemble and place this roof truss. So here you can see they're, they're laying out a, a truss that's going to look something like this, and they're using sensors to, uh, to automate the cuts and also to think about where they want the pieces to be placed. And this is a longer video, which I linked to here on the slides, because I'm not going to show the whole thing. Yeah, here's Google, you see their gantry. And, um, but you can, you can start to see the ideas between a fully automated line, right, compared to a manual line, which we saw from Schanheim and uh, Bo Klug. Um, so they, they really focus on the automation of the, of the processes, but you need more floor space, you need more technology, but you have less human workers. So there's a trade-off here in, in, the, in the different ways of approaching this. Um, so you can watch that full video later. We don't have time to do the whole thing. Um, then we also could think about what is your factory layout? So this is from the Barclay Group in the UK. Um, and this was their, um, their factory layout. So they had the goods come in and then they go to these different stations like the framing station, the bathroom, the kitchen, the painting, the sub-assembly, and then a testing station that goes out, right? So they're trying to think about the optimal way of setting up within a factory environment, what it looks like. And if, you're gonna, if your solution is gonna have a um, single integrated factory, you should start to think about what will be the design of your, of your factory setup. Um, here's another example, which I think I shared earlier in the class from Japan, where they do this, a similar idea where they have a U shape, they supply and work on the inside, and then they have materials coming in from the outside so that you don't, um, you, you don't disrupt the flow of, the, of the, the workers and of the modules moving inside of the building.
Um, and uh, going back to Bokluk, Yerker mentioned this, and I asked him if he had any slides if he wanted to share. This was the restructuring of their factory. So they decided that they wanted to increase their capacity, and so they invested in uh, a restructuring of their factory processes in 2019. Um, and the idea was the automation of, of all the element productions and creating one long balanced assembly line for the modules here. Um, so what they tried to do is uh, to move from four parallel lines, which they had, to one single assembly line, right? So all the processes were in, 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 uh, in following each other. Um, they, they focus on a new wall and ceiling line in Hall 17, a new floor line in Hall 16, and finally the new automated wood processing unit. And if they could not fit it on the single line, what they would do is they would kind of prefabricate smaller modules within the modules that would then kind of flow into the single piece flow. And those of you that have been in my lean class know we talk about um, single piece flow and the idea of, of eliminating um, uh, inventory between stations, right? Um, and so the idea here is that they go towards one single module flow similar to car factories, right? So this is how they modeled their stations in detail. So here you come in with, at step one and you start moving and they always supply the materials um, from the safe side, they call it. So uh, easy to replenish the materials from these different sides, but the modules flow up over this way and out. And here you have pre-assembly for the production lines as you might need. Um, and so they have their, all their stations picked out. You do not need to go to this level of detail <laughs> with deciding your stations, but it's just an example of the thinking they put behind the different stations. And they also try to develop a single, um, single piece flow with a similar tack time so that each uh, module has a roughly the same amount of time and then it will move to the next step. Um, so if you match and you create this parade of, of units uh, like a train, everything moves without any buffers. But that's a detailed topic for my lean class. We don't need to get into that too much here. Um, finally, this is uh, how we might think about supply chain management and logistics, the scoring of the activities uh, using the, the range of zero to four. And if you remember, um, you'll have to kind of assign some points. Um, so if, if it's zero, you don't really think about logistics. You just kind of, when, when everything is done, you send it out and you hope it gets delivered on time. One is you start to use uh, better solutions and storage uh, and information exchange with key suppliers. Um, then you start to go towards uh, two, where you start going into just in time or some of the lean principles, uh, low inventory um, and relations with the key suppliers. Then at three, you start to really go into this uh, supply chain activities, integrate into the construction process. So you're really overlapping supply chain and construction. Um, you start to think about technical solutions for information flow. And then four would be a fully integrated process where you would use technologies like RFID and advanced sensors. So you have a very advanced feedback loop from your supply chain to the construction site. So that's, that's an example there. And some of the questions that you can ask as you, as you think about your factory strategy and your production strategy, um, you know, what will be your factory locations or partner locations? So where, where will you would like to place your central factory? It should be somewhere that is close to your primary first market. Um, but then also, where would you think about uh, uh, expanding or where would be other partner locations of other suppliers? Um, what is your factory layout? How does it look? Do you, you know, do what kind of uh, a layout will you have between the modules? How many stations will you have? Um, what is your transportation strategy? Are you going to be international and use shipping? Um, are you going to just use trucks and lorries? Are you going to use trains? These are all decisions you can make. And how much assembly will be on site, right? So, so how will you, and also how can you create specialized tools to assist with that assembly, right? So if you're doing something like 3D printing on site, what is the setup of your 3D printing station? How long does it take to set that up? Um, if you are, have modules, what type of cranes do you need? Um, you know, again, we are not asking that you answer all of these with your proposed idea, but you should start to put some thinking into these questions around supply chain and, uh, and logistics. And again, this is why we say that industrialized construction is different than just offsite or prefab because industrialized construction includes thinking about these, these topics and not just um, making things uh, offsite. So, um, yeah, and then finally, we've talked a little bit about this idea of measurement and reuse of expertise. Um, so uh, I showed, the, I think, these earlier, but it's the idea that you measure and, and track your experience in the factory so you can track how well you're doing. Um, and these are just a couple of examples you could also think about um, 
creating metrics for success in your, in your um, company. So uh, what are your metrics for success? How many modules produced per day in the factory? Um, how many should be assembled in site in one day? Um, if, it's, if you're doing something like additive manufacturing, I keep using that as an example, but just trying to get away from just thinking about volumetric modules. Um, how, what's your printing time and how, how many houses will you, or how many modules will you print in a day? Um, uh, what is the number of labor hours per module? The number of accidents? What are your goals for these? Um, how long does it take you to, to produce the permit drawings and the structural calculations? How many warranty issues do you think you'll have per year? How satisfied do you want your customers to be? Is, uh, is 100% the, the goal? Is it 90%? What, what's your kind of satisfied customers? So these are some of the questions you can also think about um, for, for success. How do you measure success? Because then you, if you measure it, you can start trying to improve upon it. Um, and here are uh, uh, some examples of, of, of how we do um, systematic performance measurements and how much emphasis you put on this category.